Paramedic Pediatric Emergencies, Part 5. In this lecture, we're going to discuss shock and cardiovascular emergencies. Cardiopulmonary arrest is most often associated with respiratory failure and shock. Most of the result of respiratory failure leading to shock or ischemia caused by inadequate myocardial blood flow resulting from hypovolemia, sepsis, and cardiogenic shock. For these patients, treatment of respiratory failure or shock may prevent the arrest. About 25% result from sudden dysrhythmias such as pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And in these situations, it's crucial for you to deliver high quality CPR, early shock, and prompt defibrillation. So by definition, shock is an inadequate delivery of oxygen and nutrients to tissues to meet metabolic demand. Doesn't matter what the pathophysiology is of the type of shock, it all goes back to one thing, and that's inadequate cellular perfusion. You may encounter three types in both children and adults, hypovolemic, distributive, and cardiogenic. Determine the cause of the shock and quickly determine whether the child is in a compensated or decompensated state. Remember, as we've always talked about pediatric patients, pediatric patients have a very high tolerance for compensation. They compensate well until they don't, and then they crash. Compensated shock, the child has critical abnormalities of perfusion, but the body, for the moment, is able to maintain adequate perfusion to vital organs by shunning blood from the periphery, increasing the pulse rate, and increasing the vascular tone. In this state, the pediatric patient may appear normal. You may see some tachycardia and some signs of decreased peripheral perfusion, such as cool extremities, with prolonged capillary refill. It is critical that you as a paramedic recognize this quickly and provide timely intervention to prevent them from going into decompensated shock. Once we get decompensated shock, all mechanisms have failed to provide adequate perfusion. This includes hypotension, which would be relative to the age of the patient the child will be profoundly tachycardic and show signs of poor per peripheral perfusion. And they may have an altered appearance reflecting inadequate perfusion of the brain. Because children typically have strong cardiovascular systems, they're able to compensate for inadequate perfusion by increasing the pulse rate and peripheral vascular resistance more efficiently than adults. And so for this reason, hypotension is a late and ominous sign urging uh, you to really pay attention and you've got to provide urgent intervention. The initial management across the board for decompensated shock is going to be position of comfort and supplemental oxygen. Transport decision based on the severity of the problem if they're in decompensated shock, this should be a rapid transport situation. Remember, this is a resuscitation situation, and so you will have to start resuscitation on the scene for any child who's showing signs of decompensated shock but you've got to get them to the appropriate facility. So specific types of shock, hypovolemic shock is the most common cause of shock in infants and young children. Hypovolemic shock is typically related to their small blood volume and an excessive fluid loss, most likely with poor intake of an infant or young child with gastroenteritis or the stomach bug, diarrhea, vomiting, this puts this child at a very high vulnerability state. Also, they're very high to experience hypovolemic shock with hemorrhage as well. And of course, the treatment's going to be different if it's a hemorrhagic shock. Signs of shock progression. Patient becomes restless and less alert. Increased respiratory rate. Delayed capillary refill, cool skin, and hypotension. You also may see signs of dehydration, such as sunken eyes, dry mucous membranes, and poor skin turgor. If the child is injured and bleeding, the site of bleeding needs to be identified. For hypovolemic shock, initial management, position of comfort, supplemental oxygen, keeping the child warm, direct pressure to stop any external bleeding, and then volume replacement. Volume replacement is a mainstay of treatment for hypovolemic shock, whether medical or traumatic in origin. Once access has been established, begin fluid resuscitation with isotonic fluids. Begin with a 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus, then reassess the status. 
you should try to warm the IV fluids if possible to counteract the effects of systemic hypothermia from environmental exposure, blood loss, or open wounds. Multiple fluid boluses may be necessary, and you need to be able to remember your access sites. If you cannot get IV, then IO is certainly acceptable. Address volume resuscitation separately from hypoglycemia. With shock due to medical illness, perform a bedside glucose check. Treat with dextrose-containing fluid only for a documented low blood glucose level, meaning that we're not going to just administer um, a mixture of D10 or D5W unless we confirm their hypoglycemic. With distributive shock, there's several types of shock that fall under distributive shock, but basically this is decreased vascular tone. So the container is open and we've lost pressure, vasodilation and third spacing of the fluids due to increased vascular permeability. You'll have leakage of plasma out of blood vessels into the surrounding tissues and it results in a drop in effective blood volume and functional hypovolemia. This could be due to some subcauses, sepsis, anaphylaxis, adrenal insufficiency, or even possible spinal cord injury. Sepsis accounts for most pediatric cases of distributive shock. Early in distributive shock, the child may have warm flesh skin and bounding pulses. This is a result of peripheral vasodilation. Signs and symptoms of late distributive shock are similar to those with hypovolemic shock. Fever is a key finding in septic shock. Uticarial rash and wheezing may be noted in anaphylaxis, and neurologic deficits are apparent in shock due to spinal cord injury. First-line treatment is volume resuscitation. In a child with apparent sepsis who remains persistently hypotensive despite up to 60 milliliters per kilogram of isotonic fluids, vasopressor support to improve vascular tone may be considered. If anaphylaxis is present, you need to give your gold standard IM epinephrine. Adrenal insufficiency can also lead to distributive shock. Patients may have a pre-existing condition such as Addison's disease or adrenal suppression from chronic steroid use. These patients will benefit from fluids but will need stress dose steroids to maintain circulation. Medical direction may order that two milligrams per kilogram be given for this purpose. Cardiogenic shock or pump failure. It's uncommon in the pediatric population, may be present in children with underlying congenital heart disease, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, rhythm disturbances. It's important to recognize cardiogenic shock from the history or primary survey, and treatment is different from that for hypovolemic or distributive shock. Also remember in a CPR case or resuscitative case, if you do get return to spontaneous circulation, you're still going to have to add pump support because that child is still going to be in cardiogenic shock briefly. These are signs and symptoms that may be included in a child who is experiencing cardiogenic shock. Listless or lethargic appearance like hypovolemic or distributive shock. Increased work of breathing due to heart failure and pulmonary edema. Impaired circulation. Pale mottled cyanotic or clammy skin abnormal pulse rate or rhythm or findings of a murmur or a gallop, an enlarged liver, sweating with feeding, and history of congenital heart disease. Initial management includes the same as the others, position of comfort, supplemental oxygen, transportation, and additional supplemental oxygen and ventilation if needed. Supplemental oxygen may not increase oxygenation saturation in children with particular types of congenital heart disease, and parents will often alert you to this fact. Treat dysrhythmias as if they are present and contributing to shock. Moving into cardiovascular emergencies, these are rarely seen in children, often related to respiratory insufficiency or arrest or infection, and you should be able to identify this through your primary survey. The dysrhythmias you may experience classify based on the pulse rate, your Brady dysrhythmias or your too slow dysrhythmias, your tachy dysrhythmias or your too fast, and then of course your pulseless or your absent and you're gonna follow the particular algorithm for each of these. Bradycardia or bradydysrhythmias are often secondary to hypoxia in children. Most often you're going to see bradydysrhythmias due to hypoxia. So obviously your first line treatment in any 
dysrhythmia, and especially bradydysrhythmia, is going to be airway management, supplemental oxygen, and assistive ventilation is needed. Less common causes of bradycardia include hypothermia, congenital or acquired heart block, toxic congestion of beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or digoxin. Elevated intracranial pressure can also cause bradycardia and should be considered in children with the following ventricular shunts, history of head injury, or suspected child abuse without a consistent injury history. A bradydysrhythmia can cause cardiovascular compromise. Be alert for signs and symptoms, acute changes in mental status, dizziness, fatigue, hypotension, lightheadedness, respiratory distress or failure, shock or syncope. Here's the 2020 updated pediatric bradycardia with a pulse algorithm. Very important to note here in a pediatric patient, if you do need to give medications, epinephrine will be your first line drug if the bradycardia persists and you need to give epinephrine, 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Atropine may be considered for increased vagal tone or primary AV block, but again, your very frontline treatment is going to be to try to improve oxygenation and then give epinephrine. Tachydysrhythmias are going to be situations where the pulse rate is higher than normal for the age. You've got your narrow complex tachycardias, and your wide complex tachycardias. You need to interpret the significance of a tachycardia in conjunction with your physical examination findings and the patient's history. Most likely your sinus tachycardias are gonna be caused by another issue. Look for fever, pain, anxiety, increased activity, exercise, and note if it's occurring as a compensatory response to hypovolemia, hypoxia, or heart failure. Your treatment is going to be directed at underlying cause. No matter what, treat with antipyretics if the child appears well but has a fever. Use fluid resuscitation for a child with sinus tachy and a history of vomiting or diarrhea. For your narrow complex tachycardia, this would be supraventricular tachycardia, which is the most frequent tachydysrhythmia requiring treatment. Your ECG will reveal a regular ventricular rhythm with a narrow QRS complex. The heart rate's often 220 beats per minute or faster in an infant and 180 beats per minute or faster in a child and remains constant. Treatment depends on perfusion and stability. If stable, consider vagal maneuvers while obtaining IV access. If poor perfusion, synchronized cardioversion is recommended. If the child is hemodynamically stable and the SVT persists despite the use of vagal maneuvers, consider administration of adenosine. Administration will be followed by a brief run of bradycardia, VTAC, VFib, or systole, which will convert spontaneously to sinus rhythm. Persistence of any of these rhythms is rare, but be prepared to switch to dysrhythmia algorithms if necessary. For a child with SVT who is hemodynamically unstable, synchronized cardioversion is going to be the recommended treatment. The dose of the initial synchronized cardioversion attempt is 0.5 to 1 joule per kilogram of body weight. If the first shock is unsuccessful, increase the energy level to two joules per kilogram. Because cardioversion is a painful procedure, sedation should be provided to an awake patient before the procedure when possible. Why QRS complex tachy or your VTAC with a pulse? It's rare but potentially life-threatening and it may reflect underlying cardiac pathology. Sometimes SVT may manifest as a wide complex rhythm and distinguishing between the two can be challenging. So in this case, we may consider adenosine IV to help differentiate SVT from VTAC if the following conditions are met. The child is in hemodynamically stable condition, IV access is available, and the patient's ventricular rhythm is regular and monomorphic. If the rhythm persists despite adenosine administration, Amiodarone will be the medication of choice. Procainamide is an acceptable alternative, or medical control may also recommend giving lidocaine. This is the tachycardia with poor perfusion algorithm. Pulseless arrest, this is going to be either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, or a Sicily MPEA. The main thing with both types of pulses arrest is going to be high quality CPR and airway management. 
Survival rate from pediatric arrest in a perihospital setting is poor. Few survivors have good neurologic outcomes, but to provide that child with the best chance of having a good outcome, early identification, early CPR, early compressions, and early defibrillation is required. Pulseless arrest, we're going to do early CPR. We're going to do everything that we would have done with our VTAC defib algorithm, except we're not going to deliver defibrillation. Epinephrine ASAP is very important once we have begun compressions. If you're in a situation where you can go ahead and defibrillate, you need to go ahead and defibrillate at two joules per kilogram, followed by a second shock of four joules per kilogram. Subsequent shocks greater than four joules per kilogram to a maximum of 10 joules per kilogram or the adult dose. Also notice your drug dosages here. Epinephrine 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram of the 0 0.1 milligram per milliliter concentration with a max dose of one milligram. Repeat every three to five minutes. Amiodarone five milligrams per kilogram bolus during cardiac arrest may repeat up to three doses for refractory VFib and VTAC, or lidocaine, your initial one milligram per kilogram loading dose. Heart failure cannot meet metabolic demands at normal physiological venous pressures. Infants typically present with tachypnea, respiratory distress, grunting, and difficulty with feeding. Children will often have profuse sweating, increased work of breathing during feedings. Older children may have tachycardia, crackles, or an enlarged liver. Treatment of heart failure focuses on correcting hypoxia, reducing preload, reducing afterload, and improving myocardial contractility. You'll need to work quickly to help relieve the patient's symptoms. Possible treatments may include oxygen, diuretics, inotropic medications, possibly CPAP. Use the IV fluids judiciously because these patients are prone to worsening symptoms or fluid overload. Myocarditis is a condition due to inflammation of the heart, results in myocardial dysfunction, and can lead to heart failure. In contrast to adults, most children with myocarditis present with acute disease resulting from a viral infection. A couple of different types of cardiomyopathy. You've got dilated cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy is also a type as well. Dilated cardiomyopathy is a progressive dilation of the ventricles and poor contraction of the myocardial muscle fibers. You lose your stretch, you lose your push. Typically due to viral infection or toxicity, the patients can present with fatigue, weakness, and signs of heart failure. Dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common type of cardiomyopathy in children. It's estimated that at least 30% to 50% of the cases are inherited. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the heart muscle is unusually thick and the heart has to pump harder to get blood to leave. This type of cardiomyopathy is an inherited disorder. Symptoms usually appear in the school age years or during adolescence and may include chest pain, dysrhythmias, dyspnea, and it, with exertion, syncope, and sudden death. When hypertrophic cardiomyopathy occurs during infancy, signs and symptoms are those of heart failure. Restrictive cardiomyopathy, ventricular filling is impaired because the walls of the ventricles are stiff due to endocardial disease, myocardial disease, or both. Your assessment management of cardiovascular emergencies, more, more particularly these disease processes just discussed. You're always going to begin with your pediatric assessment triangle, your primary survey, and your secondary assessment. An abnormal appearance may indicate the need for rapid intervention. Look for abnormal vital signs and abnormal breathing rates. Tachypnea is common with a primary cardiac problem. Increased work of breathing and a fast respiratory rate are common with heart failure. For a suspected cardiovascular problem, an abnormal appearance may indicate inadequate brain perfusion and the need for rapid intervention. Determine the likely underlying cause, the patient's priority status, sick, not sick, critical, not critical, the need for treatment or transport, and always continue to repeat your PAT and your ABCs after intervention. This concludes this section of pediatric emergencies.
If you have any questions, please email me, nickray at suscc.edu.